Okay, so um, thanks again for everybody for joining. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, perhaps before some of you joined, um, this wor workshop idea came out of um, putting online a local session that, that we host uh, every month. And uh, so it's kind of an experiment. I've never hosted a Zoom workshop. I've done some lessons, but, um, and if anybody wants to explore this further, um, you can just let me know. Or if you have any other questions, need materials or, or whatever, just uh, you can always um, go to my website, um, at, which should be in the chat there, um, or just look me up online. So um, what else did I want to say? Um, just, just this is a really um, amazing uh, coming together of so many people from, from sort of 30 years of my travels and, and, and working with different people. And so it's, it's quite sweet and quite wonderful um, and a little nerve wracking. So, but every, hello everybody. Um, so the two tunes that I've chosen, um, so it's a Cape Breton style, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, uh, direct line of music from the 18th century Highland Scottish style. Um, and that's, uh, these two tunes are actually um, from around the time when the Highland clearances were. So it's kind of interesting too. So they're Scottish made tunes. One is by um, William Marshall, I believe early 1800s. And um, the other one is by Robert McIntosh, I think in the latter part of the 1700s. Uh, the uh, Highland clearances when the, the, a lot of the Highlanders were kicked out of their homeland um, so that uh, the lowlanders can raise, raise some more sheep. Uh, started about 1780 to 1850. Anyway, so this is a special place in, in Nova Scotia, Canada, Cape Breton Island that's kind of became a, a stronghold of 18th century Highland culture. And that's where that's a, the basic uh, background of Cape Breton music. So a combination of old uh, Scottish uh, music and um, modern how it developed in modern. So these two tunes are old tunes, but they're played in Cape Breton. Uh, the, so there's a Strathspey, and uh, that's the kind of tune that has a lot of uh, dotted rhythms, especially the snap. Ta -dum, ta -da, ta -dum, ta. There are different ways of playing that snap. Um, of the Scottish uh, traditional music of today, fiddle music of today, is mostly a revived tradition. Um, after they kicked out the Highlanders, they had, uh, I guess, uh, some decades went by, perhaps even as much as 100 years uh, or 50 to 100 years. And, and then they realized, oh, wait, there's all this wonderful music. And a guy named J. Scott Skinner kind of almost single-handedly kind of revived the tradition, uh, mixing in more uh, romantic uh, era type um, technique. And that also out of that came the revived tradition came the, uh, the Scottish country dancing and so on. Um, and, and Highland dancing. So um, the Strathspeys in particular, and all of music, all the types of music in this, in this style um, are played differently in that style. So that's just a little bit of a background just in case some people are saying, oh, that's not the way I know Scottish Strathspeys. So I'll just play for starters, um, just, uh, I'll just play the whole Strathspey that we're, we're about to learn. Um, and it's, uh, it's called Lord Alexander Gordon's, I think. Yes. Yeah. So it sounds like this. I hope that didn't blow. Yes, the level's okay for everybody. But. That's just one time through. Uh, I'll just play it one more time and just see if you're, if you're, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this music, but maybe some of you aren't. Um, hearing that what you're, what you'll be listening for is, uh, and feeling is the, the way that the, the, the tempo and the timing, they call it, is very, very steady, that feeling, but within that steady feeling. So it's not like uh, classical music. It doesn't have as much flexibility in the phrasing here and there, and you can kind of, you know, it's, it's rock steady, and that's also reflected in how you hold the, the fiddle. Um, so you're not sort of, 
you have not having that kind of flexibility it's really you know very steady and where the flexibility comes in and this is kind of the amazing juxtaposition is is the, the pairs of notes or maybe sometimes triplets in this case um, the pairs every beat how that gets divided um, so it's basically you can have long shorts or you can have short longs or you can occasionally have equals but the equals will in a way sound less equal than the other ones because they're not as common so how you decide uh, you know or, or you're deciding which ones is it short long long short or equal and how short and how long that's where a lot of the of the uh, the, um, the style you know comes into play so so if I played it just rhythmically or a lot of the feeling of it kind of goes away. So even though the, the tempo and the timing is very steady, you're going to actually play um, within, there's a lot of flexibility within each beat. So that's just this basic sort of overview of how it's going to sound. Lots more, of course, about the style and how you connect notes and ornaments and all sorts of things. But let's actually just dive in right now and see how this thing goes. Um, so I think um, I'm going to start with just breaking it down uh, a few notes at a time and see how that goes. We're in the key of A. So actually, why don't we just all start by playing? Playing a scale in A, just so we know where, what we are, so starting there, here we go, and high threes on the low strings. time and this time just do one more thing for me uh, uh, when you get to the open strings um, play both the four and the open because that's really important in this music so instead of and then choosing either four or open play them both and for extra credit you can just do a little ornament on the on the open string there we go and play and again, again, and down, again, there it is, excellent. Well, We'll just review our uh, harmonies when we get to the uh, uh, the real. Um, you might notice that when I play, my my hand is not my arm isn't straight, and and one reason and for the, those of you who are classically trained, oh well, he's playing with pancake wrists. Well, yeah, I am, <laughs> but that's a combination of various things. I don't use shoulder rest and, or, and things like that, and um, and just changes a little bit of the style. But here, particularly in Cape Breton. Um, ornaments and, and for example that unison it's a lot easier and um, just better a uh, sounding um, to get to get there in, uh, instead of, if I did it with a straight wrist it's a lot harder than you see it just kind of fits more 
And it's just, it's just as long as you're, you're flexible, so you don't, you don't get stuck anywhere, I recommend some, kind of playing with that idea. So instead of, it's a lot harder when you keep kind of a, a correct classical hold. Um, while I'm on that subject, even the way you hold the fiddle um, is going to be different because you're after a kind of a sound that has a bite and a stickiness to it. That's hard to do in normal classical hold where you're pulling more. You can accent if you want. But that's not the same thing as this. Hear those pops and sizzles? That's because I'm, I've gotten the fiddle up a little bit higher and I'm pushing instead of pulling. I'm pushing in both directions. So that's just a little bit of a basic thing. One last scale with that in mind. We're push down and push up and we'll do the little uh, unison trills on the open strings. And here we go. And down. I'm just going to, even before we start here, I just I realize we've gone at 10 minutes or so. I just want to make sure um, everybody is doing okay. Um, I'm going to just meet everybody for a minute now. And if anybody has any quick questions or things they want to check in with me about, it, I don't know, it's alphabetized, so I don't know if uh, who doesn't have access to recording. But again, if, if you wanted access to recording and you don't get it, just let me know after and I'll make sure you get a link to something. Everybody okay? Let's get to the tune then. Okay, off we go. All right. I'm gonna try that. So we start with a nice low note. And I just go ahead and play both the, both both the A and the E on, on the bottom strings, then open A. Skipping one note, but otherwise it's a scale. And then you repeat the first two notes. So I'll just play that a few times. Once again, the low note, and then starting on the A, skipping the B, Again, again, all right, a couple of things you can already start, um, let's see, make sure everybody's muted, um, just a couple of things you can already do is you can do a, what I call a warble on the bottom. So it's kind of like um, a little bit like an, an ornament, like, but I'm, I'm going very fast and very light with a very light finger. So it can be a combination of a vibrato and, uh, and a mordant. So it sounds... And you can also drone the E string right away. And of course, that fourth finger. So. Here we go, a few times. things to tell you about but let's go on to the next part of the tune and we'll see what we have time for all right next part starts on an open E so two open E's and then from the F sharp down the scale I'll just repeat it a few times again All right, 
right? Now, um, a thing about the note about that um, fast bit, those will write, will re, are written out as sixteenth notes when you look at the music later on, because of course you're not looking at the music now, are right? <laughs> you? Um, and the, those, when you see sixteenth notes like that, uh, four sixteenth notes in a tune like a Strath's Bay, um, they will never be played evenly. So it'll never be. Um, that you have basically three options. You have uh, the, the main option, I think, the one that'll get you um, where you want to go quick, uh, the, the easiest, is to play them faster than, they, than they're all kind of metrically allowed to go. Uh, and then you hold the last one until the next beat, like this. So that's exaggerated. Um, but I'll just do that a few more times and then I'll show you the d other ways that, to do that. So we'll just do that together a few times. Well, the same phrase with a extra fast 16th notes and then holding on the last note. And if you get, have your foot going with your heel on the beat, I don't know if you can hear that, but that'll really help you. And go. Again. A couple more times. I'll just tell you about the other two ways, other two options you have. Uh, one is to do three of them and then hold it until the, have a little bit of a break before the last, about like this. So I'm doing three fast and then just waiting. So try that with me and go. Those are the main two options, but in this case, because it's a uh, perhaps because it's a sweet and slow Strauss bay compared to some of the faster dance ones, um, there's a third option, which actually I think is is the prettiest, and that is to do two small little pairs of snaps, so like that instead of or. But here's the third one is so. So you hear that? Just they're not super, super sharp, like not, not like that, but it's just a sweet addition to what we're already doing. So we'll do that a few times. I'll do it once, and you join in. There we go. And then the next part is just the beginning again. And then the ending. So we're almost there. Let's just do what we have so far. We have this. I'll just play it once. Or you can, <laughs> That's the, the brilliant thing I have to get used to. You can play along and I won't know. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, if you want to hear it once, you can hear it once. Otherwise, I'll just play it in a few times. So. And I'll do it again. Again. Okay. Probably at this point, people are wondering about bowing, or at least some people might be. Um, because you end up on an up bow right here, that for the second part of the phrase, um, I'll just do two ups. But one of the great, one of the most fun things about this style, in my mind, is, is all the different ways you can connect notes, especially on an up bow. You know, you have the, the, the slur option, of course, and you have the sort of short, too short bow option, but then you have everything in between and in, in a way that you might not be aware of. Um, and even the two short bow note option is a little different. Um, it's a little bit more of a of a pop and then another bow. So 
So this is not the best example for that. But instead of just two oppos like this, it's more of a, a little scoop. Um, so we can just try that. Uh, it's just a real short. There are at least two other ways, kind of as as, as bookmarks anyway, along this long um, possibilities, long line of possibilities that you can do. So in, in just connecting the notes. So instead of uh, you can't do a slur because it's the same note. Otherwise, it'll just be just turn turn to a, turn into a one long note. So it's either going to be short, or maybe it'll be almost slurred. And that's called looped. All right, so it's it's one uh, one bow with a resurging in the middle. You keep the bow going, and you just surge it again. So. Oh. tell you about and that's called a straight slur I just call it a straight slur because I write it with just a long line over it and what you do is you go over um, through the air like this it's a little bit hard in this particular case because what's good about this one is you fly through the air and you end up <laughs> kind of at the um, at the other end of the bow um, in this case it's not not maybe what I would use because it's hard to go way down there right so but you can do a little of it so you're going I'm not slowing the bow down at all and that's what people can't quite do usually if they have trouble with it this is a this is a technique that's risky that that you should not feel like you're in control if you feel like you've got you got it in control you're not quite doing it right <laughs> you shouldn't know where you're gonna end up where you're gonna land so it goes like this Again, again, up, and it does end up kind of down here. So that's why I don't. I think the probably the loop is the best one for this. So last time good all right we're well, ready to learn the end of the first half <laughs> you start with the same way and then you keep going on the open E so from the E you're going up the scale Back to the open E. Just try that a few times. Up bow on the E. Again, up bow. One more. So the whole last phrase is There we go. Again. One more. Beginning now. 
second phrase. <laughs> Okay, and um, you'll see on the music that there's actually a slight variation on the second phrase. Instead of, I'm actually going to uh, play maybe. So I'm 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 going to the the open A a little early, and then doing that same loop bowing that we talked about before um, between those two A's. And then it turns into kind of a triplet. That's kind of that's often called an updriven bow when you're doing the loop bowing between an upbeat and the main beat. Just try that. The low note and then the two A's. to the second part, you don't do that little um, snap. You just end on. And this, these tunes both have the, these uh, annoying high threes on the, on the G string, I'm afraid, so it's good practice. Uh, and this one starts with that annoying high three, just the very first uh, note of the second half. So you finish up, then that high C sharp. So after the C sharp, you go to the E and up the scale. Back to the E and back to the A. So we'll do that together from the C sharp, pick up and up bow, go. Again. So now you can put that uh, fourth finger open string thing going again, like this. But this time, between these notes, you can do something else that's kind of uh, cool, and you can put it in so many places in these tunes. And that is what I'll call a delay accent, or not accent, a delay ornament. Um, some people call them a hammer-on. That's another way, so I'm gonna go. So instead of going right back to the A, the fourth finger A, I'm going to first play the old note. And here's the key to this ornament. Um, in that ornament, you want the wrong note, the one that you've delayed, to be the main, to come on the beat and to be the main sort of focus of that, of that bow stroke. So not this, but... And once you got that open A going, just keep it going. Okay, so it sounds like this. Again. Then we're going to go on with these F sharp to B for a B minor part of it. So F sharp going up to B, then up and down the scale.
try that. Second finger on the D. And on that, for extra credit, you can uh, you can bar the second finger over onto the, the low B, like this. And extra credit again, we're on an E major 7 chord there, so you can also play the, the D along with it. that together from the high C sharp pickup. I'll do it. You just join in when you want. I'll do it a few times. And again. Here we go. Finishing up the the second part, a whole bunch of uh, of triplets. Well, the first time you stop there. I think that ending is the same as the beginning uh, ending of the first half. So um, let's see. Now it's a little different. Oh well. <laughs> nice try. Uh, <laughs> so, starting on the C sharp, back to the F sharp and down. C sharp up the scale. And again. One more. Now, where you we've landed on the uh, B here, up the scale for a while, down to the D. From the B, again, That last ending sounds like this from the C sharp. From the C sharp. Again. Let's put it all together. So we have from the C, low C sharp, up bow, here we go. Now the second time, we're actually going to keep going with, this, with the triplets. So just a little bit different. So you're going up the scale, and then starting with the F-sharp first finger, you're going all the way down the scale now. Back to the first finger up. Here we go, C-sharp, second finger up. First, up, again C sharp, again, and let me just show you
you what I'm talking about, how to apply having the fiddle just nice and solid so that you can be free to re keep it super, super steady, steady, but then changing things inside that steadiness. So here, instead of going... I could add slurs. But still pretty kind of um, a little bit monotonous or a little bit uh, metronomic. Instead, I don't want to sort of do sort of more sort of floating around with the beat. I want to keep that steady, but I can inside the beat, I don't have to go. I could maybe go. And in context of, of the tune, that little bits of that kind of flexibility, keeping the beat rock steady, but uh, changing how how the triplets are within the triplets themselves. That's where a lot of the, um, just the spirit and the, and the, the tastiness comes in. Um, so, I don't know if you can hear that, but that's actually the real thing there. It's very subtle, but compared to just separate, uh, just uh, metronomic, to me it's like night and day. Um, so again, just giving yourself within this rock steadiness, that flexibility, sorry, second part together. So the first time we're going to go, those are great places for warbles, that those little kind of uh, electric shock treatments or whatever you want to call them, combination of a, of a little z uh, vibrato and uh, a mordant kind of a thing. So we're going to second time. to hear. Ready, go. I forgot to tell you about that extra little, um, actually how it's written in Marshall's in by Marshall uh, in Cape Breton they started they start the second part off in um, with a simpler version that we were doing it just adds to the sweetness I think and the simplicity of this gorgeous tune and then the way Marshall did it the second time so um, instead of starting with this high C sharp you actually start you reverse it becomes and then you have the up bow uh, driven bow just like we did at the beginning, this is the same thing, only in the second part. And you can do it that way every time if you want, or you can alternate like I do, as you wish. So um, let's play the whole tune, and then we'll take a break, um, and I'll just check in. <laughs> Timing is always a strange. I always want to, you know, share all the interesting bits with you, and that seems to take a little longer than I usually budget. So sorry about that. Um, but then I'll see how everybody's doing after this. So we'll do the um, the whole tune a few times, and um, I may. I didn't say anything about the piano yet, but we'll do that when we come back. <laughs> Okay, ready? So we're going to start right on that low. Here we go. Ready, go.
Suck it. Okay, you're all getting unmuted. Okay. What are your reactions to that? David, I just had a question about the, those warbles that you're talking about. Yeah. Are you, do you actually hit the note under? Ah, good question. Um, the, the best place for a warble is going to be, uh, not. you can do a almost anywhere. You just can't do one on an open string because you do need the note under available. Whether that actually gets played or not is the question. That's where it gets gray. Um, so, but the best place is um, on, a, on a second or third finger when it's a half step above the one below it. So like on a C natural or G natural with a, an F sharp, or in this case, on a, on a, on a D or on an A with a, with a G sharp or a C sharp under it. Um, so the question is, what's, hap what's happening there? Are you actually hearing, oh, let's see. Uh, so that's a not, not as easy a one, but there's one that's really good. So there's the, there's the D. So it, it kind of acts as a piggyback over, over the second finger. Do you see that? Instead of doing, instead of doing this, I'm not doing this. I'm, so let me just, yeah, I'm not picking up my finger so much as I'm rocking it with a very uh, light, a light, a light uh, finger. See like that? I'm kind of letting, I'm starting with a very light, str uh, very light finger. So it sounds like this, very, very light on the string. And then I'm just going, zzz, rocking it like that with a little bit of kind of wild vibrato, but just like one cycle of it like this. And here's an important one. It, it works with the right arm as well, with the bow. So it's not just independent, like just, okay, go. No, but it works <laughs> with a push as well. So they work together. So, but not, not separate like that. Just. So I hope that helps you start with a light finger and just a little bit of a, of a rocking kind of a electric rock. And here's, here's one last thing, just like that, that straight slur, it's kind of a risky affair. You don't really want to be able to control it. Same with this. You don't know, want to know how it's going to come out. Is it going to come out like this, where you hear the bottom note, or going to come out more like a vibrato? It could be either or somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle is usually the best. It's what I aim for, because it has a, a lovely kind of a fluttering sound and adds a lovely tastiness um, that doesn't come from it from being too precise. So it doesn't, it's not as nice, I don't think, to do either vibrato only or a mordant only. I like, I like that in-between warble, slightly out of control. And that comes with the com com combination with the bow. Yeah, thank you. Dive, 
David, can I ask how you're doing that on the B? Because I, I understand that when you're doing it on the D and you've got two fingers in there, how are you doing that on the B? Are you talking about the F sharp? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, you used to play viola. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I translate. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's one of those things where, where I have the sound in my head, I have the feel of it in my head, in my body, and, I, and I'm just going for, for that. And it's never going to come out exactly as I imagine it because I'm not even sure what I'm imagining. I'm, I'm imagining a feel. Right? How, how do you do yeah. that on the violin? I don't know. You, you, so, so I'm going for a feel, and it's true. That's not as comfortable, not as easy to go... But you know, if it comes out more of a, that's okay. And if it comes out more of a, that's okay. But just go for something in between, really. So, so play around with just kind of that, you know, that kind of sound, and just get one little concentrated thing that that works with the bow. So, you see, I'm really. Giving me a little bit of a push there. Yeah. And that helps kind of give the right kind of energy for that feeling. Cool. Thank you. Um, the other question I had is between um, the repeats in part A, you've got a um, some kind of joining note in there that sounds, I recognise the sound as very distinctively Cape Breton, but I have no idea what it is. Um, between the end of first A and the beginning of the second A? Yeah. I, I'm not sure what it would be. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh. That one. Yeah. Oh, that thing? No, the one before. Oh. Yes. Okay, well, I think... Um, yeah. Ah, so you're using, using ringing strings of... Yeah, this is... It's a combination of uh, of the um, the snap mm. of, of the notes and just droning the E string because we're in, we're in the in an A chord there, so so that'll that'll work with an opening. Actually, I'm just gonna start um, just with a minute or two of of a bass line because this is such a fun bass line um, to do, and it also kind of helps um, both on on not just piano and cello but also on fiddle. Um, kind of understand what's going on. Not all fiddle tunes are this kind of obvious, um, but this one has one, four, five, one, one, four, five, one, every A part. So you have... Uh, you have one is uh, A and four, D, E, and back to A. So on the piano you have A, then D, E, Bass lines are so fun, you can go just going through the C sharp and going through the G sharp. And then you can add one in between. And that's a classic uh, Cape Breton bass, uh, bass run. So you have, um, you know. happening all, all over the place in major tunes, even if it doesn't quite fit sometimes. Uh, in this case, it fits perfectly. And oh, then there's this one other option that I... Chair, you put the fiddle on the chair at the oh, thanks, yeah. And so it's good to do that on the fiddle as well. So um, find those, those notes, the A, the D, the E, and then another A. Try that. Low A. Right, and now with the connector notes, so the C sharp after the A, and then the G sharp. And now putting the D sharp in between. Let's just go with the, I think I start off this whole thing by saying, okay, we're going to learn this fast. And then I sort of got on the a tangent. So let's, let's learn the tune. All right. So um, if you know your, your arpeggios, this should be super easy. 
<laughs> because it's all arpeggios. All right, so you have first an A arpeggio, D arpeggio, E arpeggio, and then a different A arpeggio. And the ending is a slightly different E7 arpeggio. Back to A. So starting on the F sharp, down to an E, and then that low, annoying C sharp. F sharp. this uh, middle, middle, middle string stuff um, hard to kind of really dig into, um, you know, kind of kind of gets a little bit, you know, um, too sticky or something um, when I try to dig in. So instead, what I do sometimes, instead of, I'm going to actually keep both of those notes there as, an, as a, a, a double stop. And I'm going to play that one instead of open A. And just keep, keep the A kind of ringing the whole way. So just to, to show you these two different ways, um, with the fourth finger, right? And even for that, after that, I'll keep the A going. Again. the other way let's try that one again Okay, yeah, we'll just do separate arpeggios for a moment here before we continue and try it again. So the first arpeggio after the, the pickup note we have. So those three notes are the arpeggio first, one, three, and four. One, three, four. Do that again. Again. One more. Now we're going to D major arpeggio starting on an F sharp. I would go ahead and just use the, the fourth finger so you have A string options. Like that. So from this F sharp, D major arpeggio. And again. One more. So far we have this from the F sharp. And again. One more time. Now G sharp. So the first finger on both strings. And then from the open A up to the E. I'm doing fourth finger so I can go with the open E string. So we last two we have uh, from the G sharp. G sharp again. One more. 
whole thing now. F sharp, pick up. <laughs> stop somewhere so there's actually that second ending which goes so G sharp to B right over to E so that's just the first finger then the low the, the D G sharp back and forth between the strings. So the whole thing starts on the F sharp. First time. Second time. Here we go. That beat that bass part, you can go. And the second time, you can go if you want. So it's kind of fun. And so <laughs> I thought I'd give a little boon to the bass players out there. Um, and piano players. So, you're welcome. Um, second part. So, a great uh, place here for practicing your, your flicks. Um, it's not a woodpecker, that's a flicker. These are little flicks. So, um, if another one of these things where if you actually can hear the pitch, it's um, too clean, too slow, too something, right? So, not. But oh, that's why they're called flicks. So I'm either flicking my like fourth finger um, like that, or you can also start with the third finger and go up and you know down and up. But it has to be again a real kind of a flick. And again, the best thing is if you don't know which one you did. Did you do? A, B, A, or just B, A? If you know you did A, B, A, then it's too slow. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Mariah. Mariah says, maybe teach him the tune first. That's a good idea. Okay, so it goes. Just keeps going, the same uh, first part keeps coming back with a different answer. So it's kind of easy that way. So just uh, alternating an open A in between a um, uh, scale down. G sharp pickup. So it's. Then down, keep going down the scale. And then an A, E major arpeggio. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, changing up the bowing just so you don't get used to anything, you know, because you shouldn't. Okay, so that whole thing is going to be from the G sharp down the scale. Again. Okay, the next 
next phrase is the first uh, first part's the same. And now it's just a, a quicker scale down from the B. B up to D. I do a, I keep my E going as well. So the whole phrase so far is like this, from the G sharp with the flicks. Last part of the phrase, the last uh, half of it, starts the same. Uh, but it's, uh, sorry, it doesn't do that. It goes down the scale completely. Do that. The G sharp, and it then goes up to a G natural. So D, D arpeggio, and uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> so. Do that last part. Just break that one down. Not just the D arpeggio from an F sharp. Again. One more. And now here's an E7 arpeggio from the G sharp. D, B. One more. With those together from an F sharp, D arpeggio. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> bit is broken uh, thirds down from the C sharp B D and then a bit of a tongue twister this last bit so after this the scale down so G sharp going down and then the G natural From the scale down again, the D. Again. So let's do the whole second part. So we have... Now the whole scale, the tongue twister bit. Here we go, with flicks, with flicks if you want extra credit. Again. 
the, the baseline, I was very chuffed about this one because I came, I like to come up with my own baselines because it's one of the most fun things to do, really. Um, but then when I went and checked the, uh, the Robert McIntosh baseline, actually this one I think was in the Gao um, collection, um, it had like almost the exact baseline that I came up with. Um, and, and you just follow the, follow that line down with F sharp. So you can just go like F, F sharp minor. F sharp minor, D, and then B minor. So, and you just follow that down with maybe a, a link. That was link. To a. So that's how you get that kind of a, a bass line or walking bass. So why don't we just try in the last few minutes here, um, let's play both tunes. Um, but just one more thing is the connection is so important between going from the Strass Bay into the Rio. Um, and uh, so what you want to do is you want to, again, kind of make it, um, you want to make it organic, you want to make it, um, you want to make it taste good, and feel good in the body. And what won't feel so good to me anyway is to finish the, the, the timing of the Strass Bay and then immediately starting in with the reel. And what I mean by the timing of the Strass Bay and the reel, you know, the, the, the timing of the Strass Bay is, is really this, you know, you know, very much that. And then the, the feeling of the reel is more of a, of a rolling feeling. More of so dumb that kind of thing. In fact, your, 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 your feet will be going heel, toe, heel, toe, kind of in a rocking motion for the reel instead of just the heel um, for the Strass Bay. So you have just and then when you go to the reel, it goes heel toe. And you see what happens with your body. You see it's doing this instead of this or this or maybe nothing. <laughs> so your body can move in a dance motion. Your, your instrument has to stay absolutely rock still. So you have, you can make all these subtle things in between. And these rhythms, subtle, rhythmic subtleties is what I'm talking about. When you go from the, the timing of the Strass Bay into the timing of the reel, um, usually it's best to just lean in to the reel feeling um, at the very end, like the last half bar, just when you're arriving at the end of the Strass Bay, but before you get to the reel. And then when you actually start the reel, to retain some Strass Bay rhythms and Strass Bay feel in the bowing. So you, that way, you, you know, you're not really... And, you know, if, if the listener doesn't know that reel, that listener might think, oh, we're into a, just a faster Strass Bay or a different Strass Bay. And you, and you just ease, and that's where the magic comes in. You're just easing somehow into, into that, new, that new feeling. So the end, uh, just see how at the very end, I just shifted the, the timing. If I were going back to the, the Strass Bay, da -da 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 -da, right? But if I'm going to the reel, I'm just going to lead in a little different. Instead of So. See, now we're into a reel. But, not right away. But, baby. Just for a moment. So in, in so that way, I don't even know where I'm speeding up or whatever. I think it's it's not that much speeding up involved actually. It's just a shift, and you just want to do that in a way. And again, you want to do it in a way you don't really you can't really uh, you can't really premeditate too much. If it's too much premeditated. Then again, you're not being open to what's going to happen to the possibilities. So, but just in, as a rule of thumb, the very end here. Now we're on the last bar or half bar, and now start thinking about it as a reel instead of a stress bass, right? But then at the beginning of the reel, it's not quite a reel yet. Not. 
right away. So all together once more. probably a, a fairly unusual issue here, but that I've been playing classical music for 50 years, and I really would li have wanted to learn fiddling for a long time, and I figure I'm not going to be rehearsing for orchestra for months now, so this is the perfect time to do it. Right. But what I'm finding in doing this is I am so locked into learning music visually, you know, reading music, mm -hmm. that when I'm not looking at music, I'm looking at your fingers trying to read them like music. I mean, it's totally visual, and it's like the ear to finger circuit is almost non-existent for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just, um, I mean, all, about all I can think of is just to listen to music with like with my eyes closed and try to translate or something. Uh, but I just wondered if you have any suggestions for trying to re get that circuit activated. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to get out of reading it all the time. <laughs> I mean, it, the, 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 um, the short answer, which is not going to be so... Uh, I know there's no magic bullet. But. <laughs> well, yeah, there's no absolute magic wand or, or, or real yeah. shortcut. But I mean, just to all, uh, the, the short answer is it's like a muscle. You just got to use it. You just got to mm -hmm. tone it up and, and get better at it just by doing it. Um, I, I was just really lucky because um, I got to start um, you know, playing fiddle uh, really early on. And you know, a four-year-old doesn't read... You know, get, you know, so just sort of okay. I'll play this and listen to that and imitate that. You know, yeah, just yeah. what you're doing is you're imitating. Um, uh, Mariah just said, "Sing." You know, absolutely. You got to get it out of you, not just the, the the pitches, but more importantly, even than the pitches, everything else. So mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, um, Kate Bretners are actually kind of uh, 
it's kind of an, a, a, a regular joke, you know, it's like, you know, oh, one caper enters us together, you know, oh, we'll play that tune, it goes, you know, it's like, and the funny thing is, the other person knows exactly what tune yeah, you're yeah. talking about. It's not because they can hear the melody, but because they hear how the how it's how it feels. And well, so, I think for me, it really is more the notes, though. I mean, I can pick up the the way music should be played and different ways of playing it very easily. Oh, once I, know I mean, I'm, I'm a well trained violinist. I'm very versatile. I read very well. I just do you know? Do you know what? Do you know what? Um, I I have. I mean. The the, uh, not to put it too fine. I I think that the the world, at least the the the, the world of people who of, of who want to learn Cape Breton music, who are classically trained, is littered with. I'm not saying you're one of these, but littered with classically trained violin players who think they know they want they know how to play Cape Breton music better than the Cape Bretoners. I'm, I'm not talking. I wasn't about, saying that. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about. Sorry, I should I shouldn't say Cape Breton music. I should say who know how to play uh, the violin better than the Cape Bretoners. That yeah. is a question that's a completely red herring. As yeah. soon as, you, in other words, I think one of the only reasons that I was able to get as close as I did outside the tradition is because I went into my immersive process listening or watching players and saying, oh, it sounds or looks like this. Therefore, if I'm doing it like this, <coughs> instead of like this or whatever, then for right now, I'm doing it wrong. That's not the way to play this music. That's not what it looks like. That's not what it feels like. That's that's not the motions that go with this style or this technique or this way of making music. Well, and I think I, what I was trying to say is until I can get the notes, though, yeah, I can't I have, get the rest of it. I have to say, you know, I'm gonna say I, I, I give this kind of demonstration sometimes, you know. Yeah. When I was learning, when I dove into this music, um, uh, I find I, I listen to some Mary McDonald playing, and um, uh, it, it um, I'm trying to remember the one that I'm thinking. Of. But uh, and I'm like, well, how do I God, this amazing this amazing sound? But I couldn't figure out how how to how to play that. Um, and I tried to tried to find the notes, you know. Um, uh, 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 so that the tune is something like um, that kind of a thing, right? And and if I try to get the notes, um, I can get the notes, but but it, it doesn't really sound like what the, what the, what was coming out of her instrument, you know. On, on I just had a tape of her. I'm not thinking of the right one, but but it's just to give you an idea. Uh, it sounds something like Okay, so something like that. And if you try to get the notes out, you know, I don't think that's even close. I think what's much closer is something that goes. But to get the right feel of it, and I know that's that sounds a little Neanderthal or something, um, and that's not quite the the, the uh, example I, I was I wanted to give. I can't quite think of it right now. Um, but the idea is that how do you get that? from the notes and I would propose um, that in some respects important important respects getting the notes first get, making sure you hear what the right notes are first in some respects is backwards mm -hmm. you know it's like you have to feel the balance of how to walk you know before you can figure out how to skip or how to you know do other things you have to kind of feel how it feels to actually be upright and and how am i not going to fall down you have to feel how it is you know the the basic cadence and and the the sounds the kind of sounds that you that are available that that this language is built on 
this music language. This so really listening to other people playing yeah, and when, and first. When, see, just as, in, in when you're listening to other people, listen for what it might feel like in their body when they're doing that, when they're making that sound, and see if you can somehow, through this being human connection, say, well, you know, they're human, I'm human, maybe I can kind of, I, I hear it, what would that feel like to make that noise? Mm -hmm. you know? And then try out that, and that's where things like whip bowing comes in. That kind of you know, how do you make that noise? What does it feel like? Well, it must feel something like, <laughs> and that's where singing comes in too. If you try to go and try to, okay, there's some accents there. You're nowhere close because you're trying to put tech, classical technique onto, you know, or an analytical combination of anal analysis and classical technique onto something that that's, doesn't really work that way. You have to feel yeah. it. You know, at some point, what does it feel like to make that noise? Mm -hmm. And that has to do with both kind of how it looks and how they're moving or not moving. Um, and then also, um, what does it feel like to like, get it out of you <coughs> singing? You know, that, um, you hear that breath coming just before that. Um, and the same thing with the bow. Right. But, but mm -hmm. you know, in order to like, what, what would that feel like? What would that feel like to go day <laughs> until you start to imagine what it might feel like? I don't think you're. I think you're going to be frustrated by just getting the notes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, obviously that's not what I'm after. Well, thank you. That that yeah. hopefully. But yeah, well, I got to open up that circuit. But <laughs> yeah, but you know, and then you know, I find that you know the more um, the more I listen and try to just to, to get those notes, the more you're hearing bigger chunks. So first, like, oh, what was that note? Oh, wait, wait, it's a B note, it's a C sharp, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden, oh, I can hear the B to the E. Okay, da da, da you know. That. Oh, then all of a sudden, you can hear, like, you know, half a phrase or a whole measure. And then all of a sudden, it's, oh, that half of the tune, I know how that goes because it just does that, you know. <laughs> you know? And, you know, you just kind of get better at, and quicker at sort of recognizing these patterns. And, you know, what will happen is that you'll kind of get the macro pattern, oh, got that half, and then you'll be wrong in two or three little places, and you'll kind of clean that up. But it, it, it does get fast, fast that way. And that's why, you know, really in, in, in the pretty, pretty early on, uh, learning by ear is just literally quicker than learning by notes. It's like having okay. to memory. Well, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Enjoy the road.